It's episode 80 of the Author Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Hank Garner. Thanks for joining me this past year and a half uh, for the podcast. I've, uh, I was looking back today and just seeing all of the great authors that we've had on the show, and uh, it, it has been a great joy for me to host the show, and I hope it's been a joy for you to listen to it. If you don't mind, go to HankGarner.com. That's where you can find all the archives of the show. On the right-hand side, there's some links where you can subscribe in iTunes uh, or for your Android device. Uh, Also, if you don't mind, click on the Amazon link and uh, do your Amazon shopping there. That helps us get a small commission that helps offset some of the cost uh, to bring you this show. I really do appreciate it. Also, when you're at iTunes, if you don't mind, leave a... uh, uh, leave a comment and uh, and rate the show that helps other people find it we've got a lot more great content coming for you this year uh also don't forget that the show is on stitcher radio and on youtube you can find the entire archives of the show on youtube just click over uh to the playlist and you can listen to them from front to back thanks for listening now on to our interview with robert jackson bennett Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, I'm very excited this week to have author Robert Jackson Bennett on the show with me. Uh, Robert is the author of a uh, of several novels, but one in particular, City of Stairs, uh, that I stumbled on a couple of months ago and fell in love with. And I, I found Robert and asked him to come on the show, and he was gracious enough to, uh, to join me tonight. So uh, welcome to the show, Robert. Thanks for having me. Uh, I ask everyone uh, a variation of the same question when we start, and that question is, how did you first know that you wanted to be a writer? Uh, that's a good question. Um, there's a, a, like a bunch of kind of vague uh, uh, um, uh, uh, memories that I have of wanting to be a writer, and they all seem to come around when I was about 10 or so. Uh, I recall, for example um, – I was 10, I just moved to Houston, and uh, like a year or two before I had seen the horror uh, film, uh, it was, I think it was Aliens, which was a terrible idea for uh, a nine-year-old or or however old I was, because it was way too scary, and the lady at the video store did not tell my mom uh, exactly. She was a very bad salesperson. Uh, But uh, I was quite fascinated with that, and I recall... um, I was in class one day, and I recall I wrote a scene in my head in which there was like something up in the vent, and it dripped on my hand, and the slow like look up, and and you know the slow uh, uh, reveal that there was something horrible up in the ceiling, <laughs> and I recall that I had like written that scene where I would like play it over and over, uh, like again in my head saying, okay, no, before they do that, they do this, they do that, and they. And uh, trying to construct it uh, to increase the most uh, uh, like amount of, I guess, uh, of tension. And uh, it was around that time that I um, got it in my head that I really wanted to do this. And I recall that I asked my mom, I think it was 10 or 11, I said, you know, I'd, I'd like to think about trying to be a writer. And she said, well, it's very hard, and you don't make a lot of money. And I thought to myself, I was like, well, I'm still going to try. And um, yeah, it was about uh, 22 years ago, and I'm still not entirely sure who was right in that debate <laughs> about whether or not writing was the smartest thing to go into. Uh, I think it's an ongoing experiment, and uh, I, I honestly can't tell yet um, <laughs> if mom was right or if I was right. We don't know right. yet. It, it's it's probably a uh, a strange mixture of the two, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, what was your first attempt at at long form fiction? Oh God. Uh, well, the please first tell me you have an awful novel stuck in a desk drawer somewhere. Well, not really. Um, I actually broke it down and used it in a bunch of my books. And the nice. reason why I broke it down was because it was so big uh, that it was very easy to break down. It was you know like a giant. A plane trying to take off. It just falls apart. So all you have are the pieces. Right. Um, and you're like, that's a was, perfectly good wing over there. Yeah, absolutely. The whole wing fell off. I can completely reuse this because the whole wing fell off. Um, right. It was uh, an urban fantasy called Old Souls. And um, basically I was trying to do like a noir uh, Neil Gaiman style thing. And I recall like thinking, 
as I wrote it, I was like, I don't know why they say the writing is hard. I'm making so many words here. Like, the words are just coming out of me. This is easy. And um, <clears throat> if I recall, each chapter was around. And I'm not joking here. I think it was 21, just so as you know. I was a kid. Uh, each chapter was around 70,000 words. Wow. Uh, there were like, I don't know, 10, 12 chapters. The whole thing wound up being like 500,000 words. And I recall, like, I sat down, like, I printed it all out, and I sat down to do the edits, and I recall thinking, you know what this scene needs is a couple of more words. <laughs> and uh, just, I was like, this isn't clear enough. I need to stick another paragraph in here. And, like, at the end of the, I mean, it was just a blimp of a book. It was it was brutal. And, um, but uh, it made me go through the uh, the querying process sending out all this stuff, starting to run the obstacle course that is writing. It never stops. And uh, trying to uh, see who would publish it. And what I received was a loud and very justified silence. Um, so that made me write a second book and then a third book. And they both, you know, didn't really take off either. Tried a bunch of stuff. And the fourth one was uh, the one that took. That was uh, 2010. Uh, was Mr. Shivers. Um and yeah, here I am. I just keep. I've uh, written. This was what my sixth book, seventh, something like that. Uh, Stairs, I think, is my fifth, and City of Blades is my sixth. And I'm currently writing my seventh. And I just don't know how that happened. I'm gonna be <laughs> honest with you. I don't know how I got to seven so fast. It's just ridiculous. That's uh, that's pretty incredible. Uh, when you're when you wind up with this half million word behemoth <laughs> of a book, yeah. uh, what, you know, there's a, uh, fantasy in, in particular. There, there seems to be this, uh, this belief that, uh, that the bigger, the better. And if you can't come in, you know, in, you know, in, in less than, if you can't come in in over six or 700 pages, uh, then, then you're just not doing it right. Uh, you, you've written some blog posts about world building, and uh, and and you seem to have some beliefs about uh, some of the uh, the glut that we just kind of take for granted, especially in fantasy writing. What do you What are your thoughts on on that? Well, I would say that uh, more is not necessarily better. Um, I think that you know. Um, Writing, and it doesn't matter if it's world building or conversation scenes or any or like action, but you're trying to do the most with the least. So when I do a world building thingy, when I'm trying to think of a cool little thing to put in this scene to create atmosphere and background and history, uh, what I don't want to do is have something that just keeps going and is extremely complex and really bogs down the story and takes away from what's happening with the uh, the characters. Um, I try not to do that. I'm not going to say that I'm always successful, but I try. Um, and and so you you want to find one little light element that really that that does that that does all the things that you need it to do. It's like the rug in the Big Lebowski. It's something that really ties the room together. Uh, and does that extra little bit. Um, and yeah, I think of it in lo like a lot in terms of cooking, and that just because you throw in a lot of garlic, that doesn't make it a good dish. You want to use just the right amount, cook it the right way, and you want it all to kind of flow together and to work together. So, yeah, and uh, I, I do see what you're saying about the about the books that are really big. Um, and that was... Um, and not that that's bad. No, but, not that it's you, bad. But, you know, because when it when it's done really well, yeah. uh, you devour those thousand pages. Yeah. Uh, but when it's not done well, it's a thousand pages of of drudgery. Right. And like there are certain books that have like that are, that are like two hundred thousand words. A lot of a a a world building and details and like hanging out in a bar kind of stuff. There's a lot of that and. Um, what can really make those sing is if they're written with a lot of great voice and a lot of great uh, 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 character. But it's kind of funny because I'm caught in the middle where um, uh, I hear a lot of fans read my stuff and say, you do so much with this world in such a short amount of time. 
And stairs is, I think, around 150,000 words. So it's not small. It's, right. it's, not, it's not a little quick read. But for the fantasy level, it, it seems like a quick read. And then, uh, like I wrote Blades, and that was a much larger book, and um, it came in around 200,000, which, you know, is, I think, average for fantasy. Like, like, like I was thinking that I wanted to make this feel more like an epic fantasy with fights and battles and, you know, like cliffs and castles and, and things like that. So, like, I wrote that, and I was like, this is a little bit more epic, so it can be more epic. And I wrote it back to my editor, and he was like, no. <laughs> no, yeah, no, I'm not letting a 200,000 word book get past my desk. That is, you know, like, cause this is it necessary and you don't need to do all this stuff. And he was completely right. And I carved out about 400, uh, not 400, 40,000 words. I cut a book out of my book and wow. I got it down to like 175 or so. And, um, yeah, it's a lot better. And uh, I still look back and I think sometimes there's some more that I could cut, but that really taught me a lot of stuff about, Trying to work in this realm, trying to work from the uh, the world building a uh, uh, perspective, because once I realized what was wrong, it was suddenly very easy to fix it. And I did like a massive edit in two weeks, which I don't recommend that anyone try. And like had to rewrite the like a big part of the plot, like entirely for Blades, and it and it worked. Like all of a sudden, I was like, wow, that was nice. And those fixes. I think are rare, where you're like, all right, if I just do this one thing and do all this work, then all the problems get fixed. It usually doesn't work out like that. But in this case, I got lucky, and it kind of did. So, um, yeah, that's the thing that I uh, feel that a lot of people forget is having a good editor. Uh, can That's what can make a pretty good book a great book, and a crappy book decent. Yeah, and a, and a really good editor uh... – will not leave his or her mark on your book. It'll, yes. it'll make it sound more like you, yeah. uh, which is a, a, a rare gift when you find that. Yeah, I've never had one of those that like really wants to kind of drive in and make a mark on my book. Um, I have had you know some say no to a lot of stuff, but you know, so, like sometimes you got to hear no a lot because a lot of your ideas are bad. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, like I've never had one that wants to, like, write from the back seat. Never had had that experience. I'm pretty grateful for that. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, let, let's go back just a minute to Mr. Shivers. Uh, you went from uh, kind of writing, uh, figuring out uh, what you're doing and, and writing these books that, that got a, a resounding silence – uh, from the world, uh, but then what was it about Mr. Shivers that that got traction, and what did you learn uh, from actually having a book that that got acquired and then went on to win the Shirley Jackson Award? Um, what did I learn, um, and what made it get bought? Um, I think that Shivers was when I started to um, try and do, like I said, the most with the least amount of words. Um, and like I wrote that when I was I think 22 or 23 and I look back on that book and I'm like that's the sort of book that a 22 or 23 year old would write in that <laughs> it's sort of me doing a fantasy impression of Cormac McCarthy because there's like a phase in which all young white dudes just get all over Cormac McCarthy and I think it's like the same phase where they want to like grow a beard and start drinking scotch and like you know wear plaid a lot <laughs> I think it's all bound up in that. It's like, let's listen to some singer-songwriters, you know. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, There's a lot of Joni Mitchell during this? <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Uh, some Guy Clark, possibly. But, um, yeah. Uh, but um, so it was me doing that, and, you know, he it's, it's extremely sparse prose. And that was when I realized that sometimes you can do a lot by not saying all that much. And, uh, like, I'd written some stuff that I thought was lighter and more fun, uh, but it kept getting dark and weird and kind of sad. And that was when I realized that even though I like being funny and making jokes, like, when I have a lot of space to play around in, I can't keep it 100% happy and jokey. I can't keep it light. At some point in time, I'm going to be like, wow, death, that's not going to be fun. Um so, and that was really what that book was about. It was about uh, death and life and a, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, you know, just runs the gamut. And um, and it was um, 
and what was actually kind of funny is that it was built like a, like I like I wrote it to be built like a, a fantasy book, and that there is a troop of travelers at adventurers who who set out on a quest and go into a strange land to fight something evil. Uh, except it was you know hobos in the Midwest in the Hoovervilles as they travel through a land that's been changed by drought. And having to go through, you know, these warped people, uh, this sort of like weird uh, 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 underground s- uh, 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 societies of um, of uh, the homeless, of those trying to find work. And uh, that was actually the most fun part, is like them as they have to travel through all these places. But so is, it, um, is it kind of like Neil Gaiman meets the Dust Bowl? Yeah. Yeah, you could put that like uh, I heard uh, like Stephen King meets Steinbeck. Yeah. Um, which Great sure, wrath. I'll take it. I, yeah, <laughs> I'll take that one. Yeah. But um, and uh, I, I think what bought what what I bought it was that I really got a handle on voice pretty well. Where on the first page, uh, the voice I think really sings. It's now looking back at it, I'm like I was kind of overdoing it with some of this stuff, but uh, it got me bought. Um, and at the time they were looking at horror trying to come back. Uh, this was like 2008, 2009. Oh, wait, no. Like it got bought right before the bottom fell out of the economy. So it must have gotten bought in like 2000, in early 2008 or late 2007. I can't remember. But, um, and so that kind of sucked that I had written a book about the Great Depression and we were all like, are we about to have another Great Depression? And I was like, the last thing people are going to want to read about. Is about a, is about a bunch of dudes like in the Great uh, 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 Depression, starving and killing each other out in the desert. But uh, at that period, there was a lot of talk and a lot of chatter that saying that horror is going to come back. It's going to be a thing. And as most horror writers will confess, uh, John Horner Jacobs and Chuck Wendig, uh, and the, the, they'll I think that they'll agree that yeah, that's that's not what's going to happen. Uh, that's not what happened. And um, the thing that seems to have survived the most is zombies, which, like an actual zombie, just refuses to die and go away. So it was the yeah. little, yeah, lo- like it was the light, fun stuff that stuck around, like the real horror, which you know no one really seemed to ever define. Like, is it gore? Is it supernatural stuff? Is it modern? What is it? People haven't really, I think, found out what that is. And also, like, I had never really thought of myself as a horror writer. I thought that I was going to be a fantasy writer. And uh, and so what happened was, like, the book came out, and uh, right after that, uh, 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 Borders closed. The horror genre never really took off. And, like, it did well, but it didn't do, you know, phenomenally well. And that was something that I learned, too, was that... Um, the book got hyped a lot, and they did a really big push on it. And the problem with hype is that you cannot believe it. Like, it's for the readers to believe. But you, the writer, probably should take all this with a grain of salt. They're not going to say that you suck or to temper your, like, like expectations. Like, they're not going <laughs> to say, let's be reasonable here. This might just do okay. Like, they're going to, like, they're all salespeople, and they all have to kind of believe the things that they're saying. So that was something that I learned too, which was that I believed when that book came out. I was like, well, I'm going to be set for life and like, let me check my watch here two days. And um, <laughs> no, no, that that didn't happen. Um, and I think that, that, that in that period there was also a lot of talk about cross-genre and the multi-genre and the genre bending and yada, yada, yada. That was all in that same time with uh the horror talk it was a, and um uh, like there was also a lot of stuff about how ebooks and th- uh the internet is going to change things and it's going to make these niche genres that are going to sell really well and that and that just really kind of hasn't happened uh i think that it was a weird period where uh reading and publishing and the literary world was trying to figure itself out and trying a bunch of new things and i was one of those new things and it just kind of really didn't happen. Um, so I kind of wandered around for a few years and wrote a bunch of different genres. Some were kind of successful, some were not successful. And it really wasn't until uh, City of Stairs when suddenly like a lot of uh, reviewers and critics that like knew me and had heard of me but had never read me or made time for me suddenly sat down and were like, I'm going to read this book. And I think it was because it was kind of... 
like to like to me it's like straight fantasy because you know there's gods and stuff and magic and but to some people they were like well it does have guns in it and therefore it's not fantasy and I was like what uh, it's got foreign names and stuff I mean it's obviously fantasy but um, I think it was just enough of that style of fantasy that a lot of people suddenly were like let's give it a whirl it's fantasy it's got this label on it that that I like and uh, they read it and they and they liked what they read I think most of them did some of them did yeah. at least and um, and now here I am and yeah like like it was crazy because I had written it to be a standalone I didn't really write it to you know have anything else after it it kind of ends on sort of uh, an inconclusive point but then like most of my books do like I don't think that all of my books are like and so they lived happily ever after they got married and had babies there's always like we have you know there's always questions um, but then like like I met a friend and he was like you did a good job of setting up that sequel and I was like I'm not writing a sequel and he was like really because I mean you kind of set it up about there's all this work to do and I was like yeah I don't actually want to show the work right. and I'm like that would be really hard I don't want to do that and he was like, well, all right, well, you should think about it. And I was like, I'm not thinking about it. I mean, like, that sounds like a big pain in the ass. And then uh, it came time for me to propose the second book after Stairs, and I had this completely, like, other idea. And, uh, um, like, a lot of people were like, all right, you did a lot of work making this world and doing all this cool stuff. Why don't you just, like, keep going? And I've... Like, had to struggle it for a while to find a story that I liked and one that I thought would work. And um, I went with it. It seemed to work. It gave me ideas for a third. And now I actually think that, you know, looking back on it, it looks like I meant to do this, but I absolutely didn't mean to do this. This is like when your house, like, you, like, add on to a house. And from your perspective, sometimes you're like, yeah, I can see all this plastering and the plumbing doesn't work for these reasons. And it's all because this wasn't intentionally meant to be here. But to someone who, like, sees your house, they're like, wow, this room is great. And you're like, yeah, it did. <laughs> I was actually going to ask you that question uh, because you wrote a blog post about that interaction with your friend about the um, uh, the sequel to City of Stairs. And in, in, in the blog post, you, you say exactly what you just said, that, uh, that you like, well, I had no intention of, of writing a sequel for that. Um, I, I also, uh, in my writing, like to leave these open-ended questions. And I, I guess I, I never really thought about it until someone asked me a similar question about something that I'd written. And, and I was like, well, it's just meant for you to use your imagination to figure out what comes next. I don't, right. you know, um, but, uh, as, as you obviously know, uh, and, and most writers know, and, and a lot of readers have figured out, um, they're, uh, you know, trilogies and and long series are really really encouraged uh, right now. Uh, yes. And and you know, a lot of that's market driven. You know, people when they find an author that they like, they they want to invest more in that instead of try something new. And and also, I'm sure publishers want to go with known quantities as opposed to constantly mining for new material. So I get it. Um, but yeah, I, I'm like you. I, I like that. That kind of thought of uh, okay, it it it's kind of your story now. Take it and uh, you know just it, I I like leaving the reader with the option to just kind of mull over what all of the possibilities could be and and to not so not be so heavy handed and to lead them to all the answers. Uh, I, I've given you the tools to kind of figure out some answers on your own, uh, but in the publishing climate that we're in now, what how do you handle uh, that desire to to kind of leave things where they are, with uh, within wanting to follow that up and, and build uh, more of the world and and continue down the path of that story, uh, and and how did you come to the decision to expand that to a trilogy? Is what I'm asking. Um, well, I got a little bit lucky because in Stairs I wrote three great characters. Uh, first one is Shara, who is the protagonist of Stairs. Second one is Zmulagesh, who is the protagonist of Blades. And the third one is Sigrud, who is everyone's fan, he's the fan favorite, kind of. Yeah. And, um, 
And I asked my editor, I was like, I was like, all right, I don't want to write one with Shara because her story is kind of done. She had a bunch of, of problems and choices and questions about the world. And what happened in Stairs gave her the answers that she was looking for and caused her to, to kind of, I guess, um, kind of make up her mind about who she was and who she wanted to be. Uh, so her arc is over. As well as the fact that if I continue what happened in Stairs, she's going to wind up in a position of power, which is not that interesting. She's going to be behind a desk if this all works out for her, and spoilers, it does. Um, and um, and that's not interesting. Like, that's where she was always going to go. She is, you know, someone who's extremely good at the office politics, someone who's you know, seizes the long-range game, and she's also a bit of a puppet master and so her place was always uh, would wind up uh, uh, being behind a desk I think a bit and that's where I wanted her to be and that's where I kind of felt the story wanted her to be but that's not that interesting to read about I think the people still want to see guns going off and you know car chases and things like that and so like a lot of people were like well why don't you write a story about Sigrid and I was like, well, I don't know. Because for one thing, Sigurd is a bit of the, I guess, the Ron Swanson of <laughs> Stairs. And that, like, he's good in small in small doses. And he's sort of a larger-than-life character who obviously doesn't totally mesh with this world. And that, like, you know, there's no Ron Swanson out kind of, like, walking around with a bunch of gold out in the woods, like, drinking corn hooch and thinking about, like, America, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and if we were to learn more about him at that stage of just him being himself, like being the super ultra-cool tough guy, that would actually kind of uh, make him less cool, because the more that you know about something, the less cool it gets. And Sigurd was not at that stage yet where I wanted to try and see his next actions because at the end of stairs he's still like super ultra badass guy uh, and he's still in the same boat as Shara and that he's about to go home <clears throat> excuse me and um, be in a place of power and I was like I don't so I don't really want it to be Sigurd because he's about to do this thing in this world and he and like you do get to see him in blades and he actually hates it where he's like yeah I gotta go and I gotta put on all these clothes and sign all these documents and I hate it. It's stupid. But, um, uh, like I knew that his, uh, 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 story wouldn't be that, uh, uh, the one that I wanted to see next. Not yet, at least. Uh, and so then, um, I thought about trying to write a whole new character. Someone who, like, had to go to this one city that I thought I thought a bit about uh, when I was writing Stairs, uh, the city of war, which is called Zvurchestan. I like to really overpronounce it because I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> and um, it really wasn't working. And then, like, I was like, this isn't clicking. This isn't who I want to read about. I don't know who this character is. And then I had a scene where she had to go and talk to General uh, uh, to General uh, 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 Mulagesh, who was rattling around, and when she hit the page, I was like, I like this a lot more. I like having her be be like there in this book. And so suddenly, I was like, Why don't I just make the main character of this book to be Turian Mulagesh? And so I said, Sure, why not? And I realized I, that I'd written a bit about her past as like a soldier and like a warrior in stairs and that she'd done a bunch of stuff in this one war that was kind of mentioned, but we didn't really look at this war too much. And then I started to think about sort of the broad range questions about the world of stairs, where at the end of stairs, uh, Shara makes a choice to sort of change the world. <laughs> that sounds so bad. To like change how <laughs> things are done and try and shift her nation's moods and attitudes. And previous to this, her nation's moods and attitudes were very warlike. And so it made sense to look in the second book at the history of her, at, at her nation's history of war and how the old warriors would react to what she's doing and seeing if these people really wanted to change uh, and to see if these uh, changes would stick, to see if the world could actually get more civilized instead of less. 
And it made sense to look at this from the point of view of Tyrion Mulagesh because she has these same questions herself. She's been through some shit. She lost an arm. She's been through like a lot of wars before. And I, you know, now she's getting on up there. Uh, when Blades takes place, she is 55, I think. So she's not young. And she is questioning her career and thinking, you know, like, have I really done anything that matters? I mean, like, I've killed a bunch of people and I've fought in a bunch of wars and I've won a lot of battles, but looking back on it, it really hasn't made much difference. We're still doing all this stuff. So it made sense to look at the world from her perspective. And it also made a lot of sense to send her to the city of war where the goddess of war once lived and ruled, but is now, of course, a ruin and a wreck. And um, to have her look at how the Continentals used to think of war and compare it to how her country now thinks of war and to have her think to herself, is there a third way? Uh, is there some other way that that uh, 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 these things could be? So it's sort of her and Sigrid stuck at the top of the world. And of course, uh, 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 they're the two old soldiers uh, thinking about how can I be something different and really struggling to find these answers? And I'm not entirely sure if they lose or succeed. It's what, it's one of them not conclusive things we were just talking about, Hank, <laughs> where the questions are open ended and the uh, fans are frustrated. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, where did the idea first come from for the city of stairs and this whole world where you've got this, uh, these, these old gods and kind of this old buried history and, uh, where did this amalgamation idea come from? Um, so one day I was cleaning the house, and I get all my good ideas when I'm cleaning the house. So I like cleaning the house. I'm not saying that I do a good job, right? But, but uh, I do clean I... and fold laundry and write my head. <laughs> sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. But um, always writing, just not always with paper. No, not always with paper, and always cleaning, but maybe not cleaning. Uh, thoroughly. Um, gotcha. And, I see we have a lot in common. Yeah. And uh, I was vacuuming, and we had left on the TV in the background, and it was the Turner Classics uh, Classic Movie Channel, and the film that was on is Prisoner of Zinta. Was was Prisoner of Zinta, which is sort of a light caper, uh, set in like the early 20th century, late 19th century, about a British tourist who goes to a fictional country called Ruritania, I think is what it's called, uh, which is, uh, the touchstone of a lot of, uh, like a lot of, uh, fiction, where if you think of something that's like mid, like, 19th century, where, where the princes have high boots and have high collars and all of the, and like white gloves and all the medals on their chest, that's the touchstone that they're trying to reference there, is right. what I've been told. And so anyway, uh, the hijink is, of course, that this tourist happens to look a lot like the king, and they get swapped by the king's evil brother, or something. I can't quite re like recall. And um, falls in love with the queen, and all this other stuff. And um, But I was kind of half-watching it, and I thought to myself, you know, like I thought about this small uh, 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 region with a lot of small countries, with a lot of strange names, and a bunch of old guard dudes and their furs and their medals and their beards um, fighting and having these old grudges. And I thought to myself, it must really suck to have to go to this place and be a, 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 an ambassador. And uh, that kind of struck a chord. And I sort of thought to myself, that's interesting. All right, so who is this ambassador? And so I started thinking, and I was like, well, she has to ha – and I – like I thought right away, I was like, it needs to be, a, a, be, a, 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 be a woman, since this is a bunch of old dudes, highly, uh, highly patriarchal, um, lots of guns, lots of swords, lots of frowning, lots of horses. Um, <laughs> in that order. In that order, frowning on a horse with a gun in your beard, um, and uh, so it was. I thought that it would be a woman, highly educated. Um, from a more civilized, uh, republic style sort of country. And, um, I thought, okay, so these guys are all from something kind of like Eastern Europe. 
uh, which culture would clash most with them? And I thought right away, I was like, Southeast Asia. That would be really cool because, you know, uh, it's completely different climates. These guys, you know, like a bunch of animal furs, not a lot of color. Everything's gray and sad. So you would have someone there who's dressed in all these different colors, have a completely different look to them, uh, and just be like as foreign as possible. Just see that big clash. Uh, and have her, you know, be extremely, uh, 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 book smart, uh, and not be a person of force, which is what they're used to. Like, uh, I thought that these dudes would all be, you know, like tough men and having to deal with this smart little woman who would outsmart all of them. And, um, so I was thinking about that and I said, all right, so they can't just hate her because she's foreign and because she's a woman. They can't like her either because that's not interesting. So why do they hate her? And the answer that I got right away was, well, because her people killed all their gods. And I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And so I just kind of went with it. And I had read a lot about how there's a lot of Greek and Roman ruins in Turkey uh, and in, and uh, throughout the Middle East. And I always thought that was really interesting because you think of Rome. And you think of Rome, but that's you know, not where all the Roman ruins are. And, uh, I had read uh, a recent article about Constantinople, and I thought it was really fascinating about how, like, you think of the guys I- 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 in the Middle Ages, and uh, I think it was the Fourth Crusade that I read about, about how these French knights accidentally had to fight a war against Constantinople due to a massive screw-up that I won't go into now. But they were, like, just stunned to see this city, like, because they had never seen anything like this in their lives, had never seen someone dressed like this. And, you know, it's a bunch of pretty much a, like French hicks going to the big city. And I thought that was really interesting. <laughs> and so um, – Very much a clash of cultures. Very much a, class of, uh, a clash uh, 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 of cultures. And um, I, like I'd always liked spy novels. And uh, the one that I was reading at the time was Dark Star by uh, by uh, by Alan First, and uh, it's about the Second World War. But instead of it being a French spy or a, 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 like an English spy or a Swiss spy or whatever, it's a Jewish guy from the Soviet Union. And like you never read about the Eastern Front, like in America, really that much. Uh, it's very rare to have a Second World War film or book or something that gets big in which it's not like a tough like American guy with a really nice jawline uh, or something like that or like a James right. Bond thing and uh, but what was really cool about that book was that it really uh, 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 depicted how like in Poland and things like that they were not prepared for th- the um, the uh, for pretty much the uh, the uh, 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 20th century style of warfare and he made a point of saying that that like a lot of um, uh, 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 the commanders that he met there looked a lot more like knights than they did like actual captains and generals and the like. And that's stuck in my head. And I thought it'd be cool to look at a book uh, or to look at a story that drew a lot from uh, a clash of not just cultures, but also a clash of eras, where you have the old world crashing into the new, where you have guys on horseback fighting guys in tanks, and how that works out, which is, you know, spoilers, not well. Um, and so that kind of really built up into what I wanted the book to be, and that it was about uh, spying as a as the new way of warfare. And having it be all tied up with like these gods and magic, I thought I was like, "That's too good. I I, I have to have that there in the background, lurking throughout." And that's pretty much it. Yeah, I, I am fascinated every day by uh, where ideas come from, and, and and hearing stories unfold like that, where this piece leads to this piece leads to this piece, and I, I pull a little bit from. This article that I read here, and I pull a little bit of what I learned in tenth grade civics, and you know, <laughs> right. and you know, and they all come together to be this whole other thing, 
and, and I'm convinced that it's black magic or voodoo uh, or, or something. Uh, Wesley Chu was on last week's show, and and we kind of unraveled where his uh, story, time, the Time Salvager, came from. Right. And and it's all these different things that have nothing to do with each other that become this whole other thing. Um, do you have any advice for writers uh, to on, on how to? Uh, recognize when these uh, these you know sparks of inspiration fly across the front of your head, and 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 how you go about collecting those things to mm-hmm. to make this other thing, or or is it just voodoo? Um, you know, <laughs> maybe voodoo. That's you know that's yeah. that's that's a front runner for sure. <clears throat> and, and, and I'm and, and I'm happy with that answer. Uh, you but know. you know, like I can always really tell when I have an idea that I'm like, all right, I want to follow this. I want to keep thinking about it where you get kind of a bit like excited and conversely yeah. I can tell when I have a, 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 like an idea where I'm like, I don't know, this is not grabbing me. There's something missing here. Um, and I think that the thing that you got to do is pull from a lot of different sources. And I hear a lot about how, um, how as a writer you should read, which you absolutely should, uh, because that's how you learn all the structural stuff about writing. But I read a lot of history books. I listen to a lot of podcasts, a lot of history podcasts. I watch a lot of movies and a lot of uh, TV shows. Um, and I just try and make my brain a big sponge for as much crap as I can. And the word crap is key in that like a lot of this stuff you're not going to use. But the 1% that you are going to use is something that's important. And, um, yeah, it's a bit like a cook and that like for cooks, they say one thing that you should do is travel a lot and work in a little, uh, work in a lot of types of, of, uh, uh, kitchens. And, um, that's so that you can see all these styles, see, see all, all these elements so that there's a time when you can say, like, all right, they've never used this style of say cooking duck in Florida. This is a Chinese tradition. But I feel like if you did this and threw in some okra and a little bit of bay leaves, then you're uh, then you start to make something that really works. And you'll know. And like with cooking, you know when it works when you when you put it in your mouth and say yes instead of no. When you have that idea where you're like, all right, so what if we did this with a little bit of this? And your brain says, I want to hear some more about this. I want to keep going. That, I feel like, is when you have uh, a pretty good idea. Then you start to execute it, and sometimes you find out problems that you weren't aware. And usually those are things that are uh, structural where you say, I didn't stage these uh, these uh, 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 circumstances right to produce tension, or this is too delayed, or whatever. Uh, but... Um, those can always be figured out. If you have that first good idea and it makes you want to like keep thinking about it for a day or two or a month or two, you can probably write about it for six to eight months or however long it takes. And that's usually the sign that you've got something to me. Do you have a daily writing routine? Um, I try and write in the morning uh, because that's when my brain is fresh. If I'm really towards the end of a book, usually the last third, I'll write at night. Um, and I don't know why that is. I, uh, I guess it's because if you're towards the end of a book, it feels good to write it towards the end of the day. And I guess maybe, I guess maybe, uh, when I'm in the evening, I'm more contemplative than I am in the morning. Uh, and maybe it's cause I start drinking at night and maybe not. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I mean, like, I can really write under a lot of different circumstances. There are some people who can't do that, some people who use a, a routine. And I do that sometimes where I'm like, well, now i got to get a cup of coffee. But uh, someone once said that if you write with a, a, a routine, then that routine can be used as a reason not to write. Where you yeah. say, I'm not wearing my special writing pants, so I can't write today. And uh, that means that you're not getting any writing done. I think that, you know, if you sit down and start cranking it out, then you're good. And uh, that's all that matters. Uh, The routine, you know, don't write when you're sick, don't write on the toilet, but besides that, it doesn't really matter. (laughs) You know, there's there's something to be said for 
uh, taking writing seriously and devoting uh, time, attention, and resources uh, to uh, to ensure that that you. Uh, you know, are are able to take it seriously, but the but like you said, there's also uh, the danger of of making it too precious. Yeah, where where the, your like Super you said, your precious. circumstances have to be just perfect, and if they're not, then you know my art can't uh, can't excel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's that. Yeah, it's it's funny to hear that because there are I think certain people that say like, well, I have to do this, or my art can't excel, and like hearing that like makes me laugh because. To me, oh yeah, we all know that person. <laughs> because like, uh, so to me, like writing is work. It's something that you do. Some, some, it's things that you have to do. It can be things that you enjoy doing sometimes, but it is something that you still have to do. So it's a bit. Sometimes it could be like the laundry. Sometimes I enjoy folding the laundry, but it's not like I'm going to be like, like I have to have my routine for laundry. Otherwise, I can't get the laundry done. Like that's not going <laughs> to fly in my household. I can't say like, well, honey, I didn't have my. I didn't have my green tea, so I can't do the laundry today. That's not going to work. Uh, I don't think it's going to work. If it, it like if that could work, maybe I'll give it a shot. But um, yeah, I mean, it, like it's something that must be done, often to pay taxes. But it's something that that must be done, and therefore, you know, just sit down and do it. Yeah. Uh, what is your favorite uh, TV show right now? Um, Adventure Time is always fun. But uh, it's only fun for 15 minutes, which uh, sometimes can be a little bit rough. I think that the uh, the um, the uh, Manhattan is is a good one. Uh, that's about it's like an alternate history about the construction of the atomic bomb in Second World War. It can be a little bit soapy at times, but also it like the second season has worked out really well. Where it's less concerned with who's sleeping with who, as the first season got a little bit concerned with in the second half, and a lot more about war and why you do things. And it's not really about the the Second World War; it's about now and how our government treats us and how we change under the circumstances our government puts us in. Um, as well as uh, the Americans is, I think, a phenomenal TV show that, for some yeah. reason, is not getting a, a, like. A big amount of eyes, I feel like, but it is like structurally perfect, super slow burn, and you want to talk about something that does the most with the least. This is not a talky, chatty, chatty show uh, that I can think of, but sometimes there's like one line and one sentence where you're like, wow, that's all it took, and this entire scene and that whole character makes sense. Um, and uh, I mean, like, that is a structurally just amazing show it's very chilly as a show about the cold war should be yeah. uh but and uh it can be like i have to admit like i hear a lot about stuff on game of thrones that i don't watch uh because i don't have i don't ha <laughs> uh have hbo and stuff like uh the walking dead but the stuff that they do on the americans is sometimes the grossest most upsetting things that I've ever seen because they go about it just so matter of factly uh, that it that like sometimes uh, my wife is like all right I'm gonna leave the room and you tell me when this is over and just sum it up for me and I'm like all right um, so it it can sometimes be really audacious is how I would put it and uh, I really uh, like enjoy it for that reason as well as well as many others. Uh, we are living in a uh, in, in kind of a golden age for genre uh, fiction television, uh, and there's lots of talk of it, Game of Thrones, like you mentioned, and uh, you know the, the new Marvel shows on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're you're not a great fan of the new Jessica Jones that everyone's raving about, are you? Well, I've only watched the first five or six episodes, and I hear from a lot of critics that like the first third of that show is pretty weak. Uh, like there was a great piece in the New Yorker about how like she likes the idea and she liked the and she liked like the last half, but um, I think it was by I I Emily Nussbaum. But she was like uh, said that the first third is is weak, and uh, I found that that's not just true of that show, but a lot of the binge shows tend to be way more relaxed in their pacing. And when they kind of get to the meat of the subject matter, 
Um, like I thought the Daredevil, I thought to myself, I was like this could lose about two to three episodes, maybe four, and it would be better for it. Uh, and I heard like uh, that piece in the New Yorker, as well as like Alan Sepinwall say of uh, uh, Jessica Jones, it could lose maybe about a quarter to a third of the episodes, and it would be a lot uh, tighter uh, for it. Um, and um, it's kind of interesting because the thing that I hear when I make these points is I hear like, well, you shouldn't think of them as episodes. You should think of them as parts of like a nine-hour, ten-hour, however long film. And I'm like, okay, well, this ten-hour film could lose three hours and be better for it. It's right. like like it's this weird idea where we – and I think that part of it is because we're in a weird place right now where we're used to uh, storytelling being serialized and that in that like like each bite has to be somewhat satisfying. It can't complete all the arcs, but it has to complete some and it yeah. needs to feel like like it sat down and got something done, like it did something. And when you hear about about like uh, certain shows, like say um, the two biggest ones, of course, are Mad Men and Breaking Bad. Like they'll say, like this one episode or these three episodes are just masterworks. And they might say that the show is good, but these two or, th- or three episodes are fantastic. And when it comes to binge shows, they are not made like that. And I don't think that they've really hit upon a structure that I think, as a writer, always works. Like, um, a, like Alan Sepinwall uh, wrote a piece uh, that was called "In Defense of the Episode." And he quoted uh, the director of Transparent <clears throat> saying that she felt like she could move scenes in the show. Like she was like, it really doesn't matter which episode this one scene happens in. Like that doesn't matter. I, I like I feel like it could go anywhere. And to me, like like that like that's crazy. Like I can't just take a scene out of my book and just cram it in somewhere else. I'm like, yeah, like right. like, like like that works fine. And it's this and it, it's this way it's like a philosophy of of trying to make binge uh shows that um i don't think like i said that we've completely uh figured out yet and that it's it's not a movie and it's not a show it's like a vague fog of story that you're supposed to consume as quickly as possible and um and yeah it, it, like it's just odd to me that i can say like all right these three or four episodes didn't really do much and i think that it could use uh uh tighter editing and to be told like, well, you didn't watch them fast enough, is an odd answer. It's like saying like, this food sucks, and they're like, well, you were supposed to like eat it in two minutes, then it would have tasted great. And I'm like, that's not how anything works. No, I just wouldn't have tasted it. <laughs> yeah, like like if I want to chew on it for a while, it should taste pretty good. It should taste right. as good from the first bite, you know, like when I first put the bite in my mouth until I swallow it, it should taste good. And yeah, like um, it's just really weird for me because. Like when I write and with my editor, like we're pretty tough and that like if this scene isn't doing anything, then it's got to go. And right. if and like you try not to leave things loose and just there for the sake of being there. So it's going to be interesting. I think in the next few years, as we start to watch more and more uh, 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 binge shows and they start to compete more and more, I think that, you know, certain ones feel like a screensaver and that it's just something always on there like in the background and sometimes things happen and sometimes things don't. So I'm going to be really curious to see how they get that figured out. I'm going to be really curious to see if the second season of uh, of Daredevil gets that figured out. Uh, But like I recall the same thing with like House of Cards where about a third of the way through I was like, how many episodes is this? And I looked and I was like, Jesus. I don't know. (laughs) And um, yeah. Well, I, I ask you the question about TV because uh, I, I think it was Hugh Howey that said uh, – maybe last year sometime I heard him say, um, you know, we're – as writers, we're not really competing uh, – our books are not really competing with other books uh, for people's attention. What we're really competing against is uh, is YouTube and Netflix dropping, you know, 12-episode uh, uh 
season of shows all at once mm-hmm. and, and, and all of this sort of thing. There's this constant thing that's vying for readers' attention. And uh, do, do you see that as a, as a competition? And, and if so, uh, what can we as writers do to combat some of these changing tastes uh, of what people are consuming? I don't really think so. Because at the end of watching a lot of YouTube, there's a feeling of exhaustion. Uh, <laughs> like it's like when you've like eaten a whole bowl of whipped cream, and at the end of it, you're like, "Crap, I don't feel good. <laughs> I had a lot of this one thing, and you know, it's it's it, now it's all in me, and it's not going anywhere that I want it to." Um, and um, with all the Netflix shows, I, I, I think you know. That sometimes it could be a little bit true of things like Twitter, which I'm addicted to. But when I find a book that really works, and I, I do think that it's getting harder and harder for me to find books that I really like read and sit down and love. And I think that's because I don't know if I'm getting older or, or like I'm a writer and that makes the thing that I do less fun. But um, I, I do sometimes wonder if we are consuming our content and our stories differently. And that, that that's changing things, but the the like the reading experience is still, I think, the strongest story experience out there, where it like engages with your brain in ways that shows and film just simply cannot. Where your uh, 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 reading experience is so it, 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 like individual and is more a part of who you are than who the story is in a way that uh, TV can't. That um, uh, that I don't think that there's something on the horizon that can replace it. The thing that's nice about prose and reading is that it's not really dead art. It is always live there in your brain. Uh, but TV, if I go back in 20 years and watch Mad Men, that episode will still be the same. I might look at it a bit differently, but it's going to sound the same, it's going to look the same, and it's going to move the same way. Uh, books will be completely different, where there are certain books that I loved back when I was a kid, I, and like I, like, I, like I pick it up, and now it's like my brain speaks a different language. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And that's, I think, is what makes the reading like experience so unique and that it is highly malleable and highly individual in a way that the passive act of, of like watching and listening or half watching and half listening as we do more of yeah uh just isn't and, and no one uh finishes a 20 hour binge on Netflix feeling good about themselves yeah yeah it just doesn't happen yeah. you know and uh, uh but we do when we find a book that really connects with us and and we find characters that we love and we become invested in them uh most of the time you walk away from that experience feeling enriched uh, and and then wanting to share that with someone else. At least, hopefully, that's what we hope our readers get from. Yeah, it. like I think it's a sense that you lived in this world for yes, a while, yes. and now you've just walked back into a, a reality. But some some small part of you is still back there in the little house that you built in your mind. That's right. That's right. Uh, very very well put, uh, Robert Bennett. Thank you for taking time to come on the show. Uh, it's been a, a fascinating experience and um tell people where they can connect with you um i'm on well i'm on twitter uh but my twitter account (laughs) says hesitantly yeah my twitter account is weird because it it just is i don't take it very seriously i make a lot of jokes and i'm ridiculous and i think a lot of people are like this guy's a professional writer i'm sure he's very insightful i'm gonna follow him on twitter and they're like all right this guy needs to shut the hell up uh and some people like it some people don't um, I also have a blog that I post that like occasionally. It's usually way more long form and thoughtful and structured. I do it like maybe once a month or so. Sometimes I'll get in, a, in like a real fit, do two or three in a week. Um, uh, and there's also my books. In case you didn't know, you can also find me in those. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the next con that I'll be at is Confusion in Detroit in January, right before City of Blades comes out. 
Uh, speaking of Twitter, I'll be doing a slideshow presentation on how to promote yourself on social media. If you go, you will learn absolutely nothing. I guarantee it. <laughs> oh, Robert Bennett, thank you for taking time out of your day to, to join me. And uh, your uh, your website is robertjacksonbennett.com. That's me. And uh, and what day does uh, does the new book come out? Uh, January twenty six. January expected publication, as they put on Goodreads, is January 26th, and I expect the hell out of this thing to be published on January 26th. Excellent. Thank you, sir. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you.